Welcome to Atomic Geekdom. Today we are here with Nicole and with the New York Times bestseller, Blake Crouch. We're going to jump right in. We're going to start talking about his new upcoming book called Upgrade and super excited, but we'll probably tap into some of the past readings as well, because if you followed our site, you know I'm kind of a geeked out fan on this. So join us for the ride. We're going to start out though. First question we're going to ask you is what's your geek cred? Because everybody Everybody claims they're a geek, but what do you claim is what makes you a geek? What makes me a geek? Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure it's different for everyone, but for me, it's, are there certain pieces of art, movies, television, books, whatever, that have like incredibly defined your life? Um, and for me, I have, thankfully, many examples of, of that kind of art, like Twin Peaks, which... I watched live as a 12 year old when it aired on ABC many, many years ago. Um, I mean, I wrote my own sequel to Return of the Jedi back in 1989. <clears throat> I still think it would hold up against any of the last three movies they put out. Um, and I just have certain things I go back to again and again because they, it gives me just this comfort and this, um, I don't know, the feeling of, of being at home. Love it. Yeah, we're, we're definitely Star Wars geeks. And I love that you said Twin Peaks. Like I grew up just down the hill from Snoqualmie here in Washington. Okay. So yeah, Laura Palmer was on everybody's tongue for most of my youth. And I was, I think we're probably the same age. So like right around 12, 13 years old, everybody's trying to figure out Laura Palmer. That's right. It's, it's so good. I did the whole um, tour. Uh, my brother lived in Seattle for about a decade and oh God, about eight or nine years ago, I was there and we, uh, we threw the uh, Twin Peaks soundtrack on the car and we just drove up to North Bend and hit all the, all the uh, quintessential sites, the, the Great Northern, the waterfall. It's incredible. You have to, yeah, you gotta go, you have to see Snoqualmie Falls and then you have to order a piece of pie and so much fun. I always laugh doing that drive North Bend is the gas station in The Vanishing where um, she gets kidnapped and Kiefer Sutherland has to find her. <laughs> so many great little movie like tidbits. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump in before we even start talking about upgrade, because while reading it, I felt like it was a roadmap of mm -hmm. like the United States. Like you bounce around the country a lot. And I was just curious, like, what's that inspiration? Like what brings you to, are you one of those type of people that would prefer to get in the car rather than fly? And do you have any favorite spots? Oh, for sure. I mean, I, I sort of fell in love with uh, America um, when I was, God, it would have been maybe a sophomore or junior year of high school. That summer, I just drove across the country and like it was the first time I'd ever been West and I saw Wyoming and the, the Grand Tetons and Rocky Mountain National Park. And I mean, it's why, it's why I live in the West now. I just love the wide open spaces, but I just tend to be very um, inspired by environments and I don't think I don't know that all writers are I happen to be one of the writers who I just like wherever I am it's definitely having a big impact on the kind of story I'm telling you can tell it definitely do you want to before we start asking you questions you want to give us a little background on on upgrade yeah upgrade is a book I've uh, been wanting to write for a long time I I wanted to I wanted it to be the follow-up to dark matter uh, I just got super intimidated by the science, um, the biology, the genetics, the chemistry it just felt so daunting to me. And so I, I sort of kicked the can down the road and I wrote recursion. But, you know, after that book, I was like, what do you, you're out of excuses. You've, you've got to write this book that's been on your mind for so long. Um, and so I, I finally just bit the bullet and said, all right, I'm going to dive into this. And it was definitely the hardest science, the hardest research I've ever done. Um, but I was just really wanting to tell the story of, of not like a, a futuristic speculative science like dark matter or recursion, but something that is about a field of science that is very relevant to where we are today. There's definitely a horror base to that, though. I mean, I remember when I first saw 28 Days Later and the whole idea when, they, when the activists go into the thing and they release the rage contagion. And you, you, you see all the news stories of, you know, them splicing genes and making things and, you know, everybody wants a berserker now. And it's like, there's the, you, you who's going to, 
who's going to hold that floodgate from happening? And what I really dug about this book is it sort of poses all those questions. And every character has sort of a moral belief of what they're doing is right. And with like the characters you write, that seems to be like an ongoing theme, which is one of the things why I gravitate towards it, is they're always based on a love or a relationship. Like it's got something to do with family. Their drive is either their wife, their father, some sort of like family tie to it. Mm -hmm. And they're not always the perfect characters. There's a lot of flaws to them. And you sometimes lean towards you kind of understand why the villain's the villain, but you you can relate to them. Mm -hmm. And like, especially with Dark Matter, you're writing the same character in multiple different ways. Like I lost count of how many, how many of him there ended up being. But when you, when you go dive into that, how do you, how do you keep them in their lanes? Mm. How do you make sure that you don't have a flawless hero and an absolute evil villain? Yeah. Um, it's a really good question. I go into my books or, or whatever it is I'm writing and I don't ever think of it of it being a hero villain sort of dynamic. I don't think that there are really villains in my books. They're just people who want something different from the protagonist. And one of the things I think is so fun about writing these types of stories is everyone is living in this sort of gray area and their morality is is kind of on a sliding scale. And I think it lets the audience uh, sort of decide who they want to pledge their allegiance to over the course of the read. Nicole, you want to jump into, you had some great, she was talking to me earlier about just the whole, uh, what were you, what, it was a term that I, I, I love books. And what was the term you said? Um, techno thriller. She, she, she said that she loves that it was like a techno thriller. And I was like, I've never heard that before, but dive into that. Cause I, your questions blew my mind. Yeah, like you, you know, so I remember growing up, I'm just around your ages. So I remember reading Anna to the Infinite Power. And then it wasn't until Jurassic Park that I really got into kind of like medical based thrillers. Mm -hmm. And you've really picked up the mantle on that. Um, what, who influenced you? Like, did you ever have like one moment where you were like, this is the genre, I'm amazing at this, bam. I mean, I didn't start out writing these kinds of books. Um, right. My first few novels, which I published in the early 2000s, were, were horror thrillers. And there's mm -hmm. still a big horror like DNA inside of me as a writer that I never want to lose. Although I, I don't think it manifests as um, forward facing as it did back then. Um, but then I, I think after my first couple of books, I started to feel like I was bumping up against the ceiling of what a straight thriller or a straight horror thriller could do. And I was looking for a way to tell stories that just I hadn't heard before and, and, and that felt more relevant to what we were experiencing like today. Cause I, I, I believe that we, that like the future is not something that's in the future anymore. I think we're, we're there already. And I, I don't think my books are science fiction. I think they're just science thrillers the, the science is real there's, there's there's not really any fiction to the science and I had taken like almost no science classes in in university so all the stuff I had to do was self-taught but once I started diving into sort of the emerging technologies whether it's quantum mechanics the science of memory genetics AI I just realized how rich a an environment it was to tell stories because you can obviously write amazing characters and place them in any story, but to put them in our time where we're facing like, to your point earlier, who is going to say what's too far in the landscape of genetics, like to put real human beings dealing with the things we're dealing with today or are just on the cusp of dealing with felt just so exciting to me. That makes sense So, like the, you read like old books, like some of them hit the mark, like if like Fahrenheit 451, there are stuff you can pull off the pages now. And you're like, that makes sense. You know, they're the walls of TV, you know, the, the video screen walls, we all have our face. So into like the, the monitors all day, every day. And I'm reading it. And what 
I like about your writing style is I know nothing about DNA and gene editing. You ask me about Adobe Photoshop and that I can talk to you for hours, but you want to tell me what's in a DNA strain? Can't do it. But I started to recognize some of your sequences as they kept repeating. And the way the conversations are had between the main characters, it started to make sense. And you knew when it was going to be a catastrophic decision or a beneficial decision. And it kept you kind of on like your toes because until it happened, you have to go back and look and say, okay, this can work, this can't work. And where do you where do you go for all your research for that? Because it's a that's a lot of code sequences. Yeah. There are pages of them. Um I, I so I, I've had a subject matter expert for God, my last three novels. Um and I knew that if I didn't find the right expert for upgrade, I wasn't going to be able to write the book. And luckily I, I found this uh, molecular geneticist named Michael Wiles. And Michael redlined early drafts of my manuscript. He did two of them that just really helped me understand where I was on point, where I was sort of going afield. Uh, Michael gave me amazing ideas for like where I wasn't even pushing the science far enough. A lot of times our conversation was, well, actually, what about this? If you could go even farther, which I found really, really fun. Um, but I, I could never have written this book without Michael. I would, I'd be lost because these concepts are, are so heady, and I, I felt like I would need a, a, you know, a doctorate or something to to have even begun to think about writing this book. I always worry about that too. Like, do you ever get just? some you know twitter know-it-all and everything that has to break it down and be like well this was incorrect or this is correct do you oh, get that kind of it will happen it's happened on all of my books uh up until now you know i i get i get feedback from both sides i get people who are uh you know self-proclaimed professionals and whether whatever it is neuroscience physics saying oh you really got this right and then i have people who are self-proclaimed physicists and no, you got this wrong. You're an idiot. You know, you'll, you're never going to make everyone happy. Yeah. It, it, and it's Twitter. <laughs> um, if you had a not chance a, to do it's not a real place. Oh no, no. And and 90% <laughs> of who you interact with is probably a bot. So, so exactly. what do you do? Okay. Um, would you take the upgrade if you had the choice? Mm. Even knowing the, the, the risks that are at hand? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it would depend it, if the stakes uh, were as bad as they were, or as, as I present them in the book. Yeah, I probably would. Um, right now, no. But the book is set, you know, some indeterminate number of years ahead of where we are right now because, you know, we still could write the ship at this point. We we could still make some changes to to maybe stop, you know, pull out of this. Uh, nosedive we're in. Um, what I wanted to do with Upgrade was write about a point in time that was much closer to that precipice where you didn't have the luxury of what I just did, was, which is to punt the question, maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't. Like you're faced with the end of our species. What are you going to do? Yeah. That's the, that's the hard point too, is that there's, I don't know if it's like a moral compass is the best way to describe it, but would you sacrifice everything, you know, in order for a chance mm -hmm. to, to write the ship? Mm -hmm. And I struggled with that through the book because you almost like Kara's like motivation and the mother's motivation makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like there's a chance. And I always crack up because like these days I feel like I'm, I'm living in idiocracy and the next thing on TV is just going to be a, butt. <laughs> like, I'm just like, we need intelligent people. Why are the intelligent people not mad? like breeding and having more smart kids? Cause it, there are moments when I I'm very, very much saddened about things, but then you get, you get amazing stuff from NASA and just, you realize that there's still smart people out there. So if it got to that point where you had to, had to make a decision because the world were dying, what would you do? Um, but I think that's what's great about it is like, if you go back to like your other books with like dark matter, what box would, what, what universe would you end up in? I always like that in that book, 
all of her choices usually ended up with an okay like world all of his is like apocalyptic crazy um yeah it's it's it i can't i don't even know where this question was going it's just a mind like bend i just keep going in circles now would i like to be able to um read a book listen to an audio and watch tv at the same time my list of shows and such i need to get through would totally love that upgrade but I don't know if it would be worth it because then I'd never turn my uh, brain off. I also think, you know, the idea of actually, you know, the idea of murdering people, of hurting people for the, you know, some better future result, I think it's really into sketchy territory. Um, and that's why there, there was that moment in the book where, where they talk about the idea that, you know, you can't kill humanity to save humanity. It, so, it doesn't, right doesn't make sense you sort of you lose what's special about us in that transaction well and that's the thing that i really think a lot of people connect to when you're writing i'm sorry jenny your your books have this heart in them that i think sometimes people go into not expecting Mm -hmm. and then they're pleasantly surprised and then somebody like the first time i picked up one of your more recent novels i was like i know nothing of this and i just i was completely drawn and you had me sobbing in dark matter with that one chapter where it was from her point of view mm. I was like openly sobbing and I was just like this is amazing this is beautiful what else is he writing like <laughs> excuse mm. me but I, I feel really like I'm do. up against it writing the kinds of books I do because um most people and I I mean I I want to bring as many people to the table as possible when I publish something but most people don't like science fiction, or at least they don't think they like science fiction. They have a lot of preconceived notions about what it is and what its failings are, many of which are completely valid. Um, I wish I loved more science fiction than I did, but most of it leaves me cold. The authors seem more interested in you know, playing around with their concept than creating characters that I care about. So I, I, don't, I almost feel like I'm this like ambassador of to say, no, no, it can have a heart too forget everything you think you think about science fiction and give this a shot. It's why my books start at a very grounded place. I'm trying to, to lure people into this story. It's like, hey, you're, it's okay. There's no laser guns. There's no spaceships. Everything's cool. These are real people. They're, they have real problems. And then like, yeah, some crazy shit happens, but not until hopefully people are bought into the story. They're bought into the characters. And at that point, when you have them, then you can do all the other stuff. But if you lead with that, I think you just lose people. I'm glad you said that too, because um, we we do a book club and we did some of the classic sci-fis and the oh, world building wow. is phenomenal. Like just the visuals that you can create in your head. But I would end the book and I wouldn't remember anything about the character. And I didn't care if the character lived or died. I just loved the world that they made. And trying to find that marriage between the two where not only is it this world that is either relatable or unrelatable, but having a character that's walking it with you is so important in my opinion. It's, oh, it's so rare. It's like, those are the keys to the kingdom. If you can do both, if you can pull, but a lot of the, like I, like occasionally, um, cause I've written in a lot of genres. I love, I like pulling from whatever genre I feel like is, you know, serving the story. And I've had people say, oh, I wish you would write fantasy. And I say, I don't, but I don't think that you would actually like my fantasy because my fantasy would be fast and it'd be like, a th- I don't know what a thriller fantasy is. And, you know, I'm not going to write an 800 or 900 page book that, you know, a third of it is just descriptions of the world. Like, that's just not who I am. And you would inevitably be disappointed by, by what you read. Yes. Yeah, Although it would be nice to have a 300 page fantasy paper time oh, I, paper i mean I don't, <laughs> I, think I, would, I don't think people would, would get on board true sci-fi people don't like my books my science fiction books because they think it's too there isn't enough of the world building it's too feelings it's too many feelings it's it's too emotional not enough like just hard science and world building uh, even though you know i stand behind my science um yeah but you know it's the whole thing of, I, I don't, I'm not exactly sure what I'm, I think I'm writing for book club people, but I'm writing science fiction for book club people. 
<laughs> well, the, I mean, that's the funniest part is when I, I ran across dark matter just by chance. Like I, I needed an audio book and I'm like, oh, I just I want something kind of dark. And I kept getting like recommendations for it. And so I'm like, all right, I'm going to do this. And that at the time I was commuting and I'd be in the car for like two hours each way. And I'd get to work every day and I'm like, I'm reading this awesome book. Oh my God, it's blowing my mind. And I'd go around and around until, and by the time I finished the book, three other of my coworkers had picked it up. And then our lunch breaks were us sitting around going, so what do you, and we just oh, back it. and forth. And that's what I think is great is that, you know, I've got friends that are deep into science fiction and they love the idea of it. They love everything about it. And especially with dark matter, it's kind of the multiverse before the multiverse, you know, craze that happens. Um, but you. then you can take it, somebody it that was. normally reads like romance novels and they were like, this is great because the characters are so layered, you know, you, you're rooting for them and the, the relationship, especially like even in this one, um, Logan and Beth's relationship, you're following it throughout the, the book and it's, it's so powerful, but heartbreaking, but it feels real. You know, it, it doesn't feel like a story that you're you're reading you feel like these are real people that are experiencing a lot of trauma right now loss and changes and and that's that's something to say you know mm. well thank you i i mean that's for me it's it is weirdly the care and it's it's weird because the characters are the most important part to me but it's also the last piece of the equation when i'm writing something it, it doesn't really ever start with the character it starts with it starts with the science and then it and then it's what kind of a story does that science fit into and it's and then it's like what characters belong in this story and and it doesn't they do not come to life in the first or even second or third drafts they really only start to feel like real people with you know positives negatives layers uh you know in the last draft or two um, i don't know it's a very mysterious process it's kind of like just getting to know a real person I think you actually really just have to spend time with characters the same way you have to spend time with real human beings to, to understand them. Do you have a character that you that you yourself gravitate towards that you love and feel like is your best friend that you've written? <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know that she would be my best friend, but I really love the character, uh, Letty Dobesh. She's the, uh, the, she's like a meth-addicted grifter who um is the the star of a number of novellas i, I wrote and also of my show good behavior and I, I, she was just one of the weird times where a character immediately just came fully formed onto the page it it, it wasn't a, a case of having to go through multiple drafts to figure out what makes her tick why she chooses the things she chooses she just walked into the room it was a really weird experience those are those are the best as a as a reader those are the best characters for the simple fact that you don't know what you're going to get mm -hmm. like if you know and they're going to surprise you no matter what oh, they're so fun to write they just anything's possible when, you, when you're writing with a character like that you and even when as as the person who's sort of controlling them they still seem to have their own agency and and make their own decisions and even surprise you the writer do you have anything um planned for the release because it comes out in what is it a little over a month right right after the fourth it comes out in about uh, a little less than two months out um i you know i'm in gonna be in chicago this summer filming dark matter so i'm gonna have a limited amount of time to do like in-person events but i'm gonna come back to my hometown and we're gonna throw a big party at, at uh, my favorite local bar here and inviting a bunch of friends and fans to that. Um, I'm going to do a big Zoom with a bunch of Colorado bookstores and libraries, I think uh, right around the release with Amor Tolls. Um, I'm going to go to some of the Comic Cons, but yeah, not a ton of, uh, not a ton of bookstore events, unfortunately, with this one. Schedule is just going to be uh, too jammed. How's it? How's it? You're working with, it's, is Apple the one that picked up? It's Apple. That's right. Yeah, how's that? How's it working with them? Amazing. I mean, um, they are making such quality shows at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, I think Severance is one of the best shows of like the last decade. Um, and it's really, I, I just, every day I feel more and more like this is the, the place where it always needed to land. Um, and, you know, so excited to bring this to the world. Nice. And now are you, are you a part of the, the script writing and, and the writer's room or have you taken the back seat and. Yeah, no, I'm uh, show writing it and um writing uh most of the scripts wow congratulations yeah i'm so i'm every time i see like a news article that pops up i'm like I'm so excited for it you know there's always that nervousness as like a reader because you know i i fall into the cliche of like there's no movie or tv show that's as good as the book um but then you're like surprised like there are so many shows that i've read the book and i'm like do they nailed it or the changes that are made make sense and so it's it's nice to know that you're behind it and there's some confidence in it but yeah, yeah apple's it killing like, it it was originally going to be a movie um and we tried to make it as a movie for a number of years and i wrote a script and some other really good screenwriters came in and and took their shot at it and we could never really figure it out and it and once we started trying to take it to television became obvious immediately that this was always the format it wanted to be in. It needed to have the room to breathe. It needed space for these character moments that, you know, 110 minute feature just would never allow to have. Yeah. Cause like as a, as a viewer, you're going to want to dive into the different worlds he goes into, you know, um, you can get intimate with them on the page, but if they're done live action, sometimes that feels rushed. So yeah, super stoked. But with that said too, um, was it Ambien? I think just picked up uh, Upgrade, which hasn't even came out yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Amblin optioned Upgrade, uh, and I'm going to write the film, uh, the feature script for that. Um, yeah, it's, it's and that and that is a, like a, like an actual sort of dream come true situation, because when I was writing Upgrade, a lot of the a lot of the scenes, especially in the back half of the book, I just kept feeling like God, this just feels like like 80s Spielberg in a weird way. Um, and then it's just so wonderful and weird that it ended up at his company. No, that's definitely geek cred right there. <laughs> you should just start with that. It's like, <laughs> hey, you know, Spielberg, me and Spielberg, we're good. <laughs> so are we getting play sets and action figures at any point in the future? <laughs> oh, right. The, the dream. Then, <laughs> you know, you've uh, made, I mean, do they still do action figures for? Uh, yeah. Non Star yeah. Wars, uh, yeah. Property, Marvel, yeah, yeah, they do. Okay, yeah. I think we could have make it happen with Dark Matter. Uh, Jenny wants to see the cube on her countertop, apparently. I want, so, to, I want to see the cube on my countertop, yeah, <laughs> gotta make that happen. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what do we have in store for after this? You got anything else in the works? I mean, uh, I'm gonna be in Chicago for the next year working on uh, trying to get Dark Matter launched and working on the upgrade adaptation and just starting to figure out my next book, um, making uh, some, some good progress along those lines. So yeah, a lot, I mean, a lot to come. I just, you know, not enough hours in the day. What program do you use to write? I mean, do you use things like Scrivener or? No, I, I, use, Microsoft Word. I use Microsoft Word to write my novels and I uh, in final draft to write scripts. Okay. I don't need the software that like outlines it right. for you in real time and asks you if you're sure this character is behaving the way it's like, I, I don't need that. I don't need it in my life. I have writer <laughs> friends who, um, who, who started messing around with it and like literally haven't written a book since. Um, I, I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm not going to mess with it. Uh, technology hates me, so I, I can relate to that. I like the simplest thing. I still do my, like, I use Excel to do my budget. So it's, it's all like, oh, that's awesome, though. Um, yeah, so we're super excited for the next book. Um, I'm assuming it's going to, I know you're at the beginning stages, but I'm assuming science-based. I mean, feels like feels like that's fair and safe to say at this point, but who knows? <laughs> Uh, one question before we before we sign off. Um, do you have personal ties to like the stories? Um, when I read Recursion, like it it really hit me because I've my dad's suffering from dementia and the whole idea of like memory loss. It's terrifying. 
um, and you follow it and you, the backlash and the, almost the butterfly effect of the story is it, it rips at heartstrings. Yeah. Do you tie any of the, like your personal experiences in when you, when you write a book? Yeah. I mean, going back to, geez, Wayward Pines, actually back to run. Um, I, yeah. There's been a, a lot of me or at least part of me in all of my novels that I've written. Uh, I don't always know it in the moment when I'm writing, like what I'm actually writing about, but it usually becomes pretty apparent to me by the end of the book. Uh, and I think it's very important because I think if uh, you're not putting yourself to some extent, like on the page, I don't think you get the authenticity of emotion. Um, you know, it's like the whole Robert Frost thing, no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. So I think it really is all about like putting yourself into the stories and, and, and finding out what, what, what like, all my books are ultimately, I, what, what's that deep fundamental question that you're wanting an answer to? That's what the books tend to be about. I think that as, as a reader, you can tell that and gravitate towards that because it makes it relatable, you know? Yeah, it's, it's also why the books take longer these days for me because um, it, you can't just dash that off like in nine months. It, it, it takes a minute to work your way through like whatever internal shit you're dealing with that's trying to come out on the page you know you kind of have to let it take its course um it's not something that can be forced cool did you got any other questions before we uh we let everybody enjoy their night i think we were talking about a, a one-shot comic to let him actually truly just like <laughs> get everything movie tv no um <laughs> we're talking about one shot comics with some of your characters to give them backstory <laughs> would that be something you would be into or not not a comic you know, i i try i wanted to write a comic one time uh, mm -hmm. and i thought wayward pines was going to be a graphic novel like the maxi series uh and i actually went pretty far down the road with vertigo on it but they could never get it over the line um and so i ended up saying all right i'm just gonna write it as a novel by the way i'm so glad i did like that was would have it would have yeah. been a disaster on many fronts if that had been a graphic novel instead um but yeah i love the form i've never written in it, it it's interesting it's um someone once described it to me as like comics are like writing a bunch of frozen moments you're telling a story in just frozen moments and i always loved that um but i don't know i don't, I don't know if i have the if i would have the chops to do it i think it's a it's like a, it's like playing a different instrument than, you know, the novel or uh, or the screenplay. I, heard, I wish I remember who who said it, but they were talking about comics are when you can visualize the story more than you can tell the story, hmm. and when you when you write a book, it's more in the head, and comics is more in the eyes. Interesting, and huh. I always like that. I like that. That's that, that's it's probably true. Although I feel I. My books to me are always very visual and I, I see them very, very clearly in my head. Um, but I think, that, yeah, that makes sense though. It, it, that generally makes sense. I like that. So yeah, no comic book, right? <laughs> Not in the near future. I, I, I would love to write one at some point. <laughs> we'll keep an eye out for it. <laughs> We're in, a, we're in a comic book club too so that's why oh, nice. if i do it'll be original i, I don't i'm not yeah it doesn't just me writing you know series or it would be it'd be an original uh uh standalone polygraphic novel what were, what were you saying to nicole like you wanted one of the characters um I to have a little miriam. offshoot comic yeah i wanted to have a miriam comic for some reason like i just i don't know like there's something else i just feel like there's something yeah. else Good. I mean, I love, I, I love that. I want people to come, to leave my books that way. Like imagining like, what's the thing that comes next? Mm -hmm. Not just, Hey, everything's wrapped up with a nice bow. Nothing more to see here. I, I like the idea of um, the energy at the end of a book. Like these characters still have lives beyond this, but we're just not going to see them this time. Well, and that's what's, so, that's what's so awesome too, because you can kind of like, as the reader, make up what you think is going to happen next you know it's like when they went into the when they went into the cube what was the world they went out of you know and you know some people will go on the dark side other people will be like 
their life is perfect now. Um, and even with, with upgrade, it ends, you know, without spoilers, it ends at a part where you're like, the earth still needs somebody. And how is that going to continue the story? Um, it's, yeah, I love that. I like, I like being able to be in control of what I think is going to happen. And then I love when it actually, there is something and it's usually not what I thought and it's even better. <laughs> <laughs> That's the trick. That's the trick. It's harder, harder uh, executed than imagined. I love it. Well, we'll, uh, we'll let you get to your weekend, um, the rest of the weekend here. We'll get this posted up on here for everybody to listen, and we'll probably razzle all of our friends and such when this hits the shelves. Because, um, yeah, you've got a good fan following for sure. Such a pleasure to uh, speak with you tonight. Totally. We'll be in touch. All right. Take care. Thanks so much, everyone.